maybe six of the uh, of the course and now my interest is going to be in being more practical we are about to finish the theoretical part of the course and now i want to uh, start getting more practical i want to start today as i did last friday with a discussion on the last assignment uh, which i submitted uh, I asked you to calculate a risk parity portfolio under two assumptions. First is the easy one, where we assume that the correlation between the investments is zero. And I think that is, uh, there's no difficulty there. We have uh, formulas, explicit formulas that tell us what the allocation is. And we, uh, I also asked you to calculate the risk parity portfolio when the correlation is the real correlation that we observe in the markets. So I'm going to share my screen because uh, I decided, I, I don't have a lot of uh, information or feedback from you as to your degree of understanding of this, but I'm, um, I'm making an educated guess as to what I think you understand and you don't. And I think it was not clear how to do the risk parity portfolio with a true correlation assumption. <clears throat> so what I propose, what, what I propose is that we do that in steps. And the first step I'm giving it to you here today. <clears throat> I wrote it down, I sent it to you, and I want to make sure that this is understood. Okay, I would really like to encourage people to ask questions, but um, I understand that you may not want to, okay? So, <clears throat> the, um, the key, to getting the risk party to portfolio is to do it in iterations. The first iteration is, let's assume that the correlation is zero and let's just get some allocation to the assets. You already did that in part one. And according to the um, notation, the terminology that I, that I wrote here, if we're going to be looking for weights Y and W1, W2, W3 correspond to, to each of the assets. <clears throat> and what we want these allocations to do is satisfy this equation. That's the equation we want these allocations to satisfy. If these equations are satisfied for all pairs i and j, then we found it. Mm -hmm. This is what risk parity means. If it doesn't satisfy this equation, then we didn't get it. And the process is going to be to construct a sequence, a sequence that we denote by this, where n is a number, n is 0, 1, 2, 3. And the idea is that as n increases, the weights converge to the risk parity weights. That's how we're going to be doing this in practice. Okay, so these are the unknowns. These are the unknowns that we're looking for. And we're going to obtain these numbers with this property that we have here. Okay, and I hope all of this is clear. I now I'm I'm a little bit hesitant to uh, take anything for granted. So please ask questions if, if this is not clear. You can ask questions in the chat. You can ask questions uh, uh, on the screen. It's up to you. But I want to make sure that this is understood because this is a very interesting but difficult assignment that you're doing. It's very interesting though. Hmm? So that's how we're going to set it up. And... <clears throat> 
in this week's assignment, I, I give you the first step. The first step is simply to call to define a starting point. This is the starting point in our iteration. This is the starting point. And the starting point is the one that comes from your allocation coming from the correlations being equal to zero. Or it could be any other. It doesn't have to be this. Okay, but since since you already did it, it would be smart to start with those cor with those allocations, the ones that come from the correlation being zero. And then what I ask you to do is I ask you to do some calculations that will get you started in that iterative process. I ask you to this is the difficult part. Okay, I ask you to calculate the partial derivative of the volatility with respect to each of those assets. This requires that you calculate a partial derivative. This is not difficult because we have a formula for the uh, partial derivative, a formula that involves only the correlation. And the formula is, I give you uh, the formula, we saw it earlier, but the formula of that is going to be uh, twice, this is three, yeah, sorry, this is three. The sum between one and three of W I sigma I plus two, the sum for all J is not equal to I to three W J sigma I J divided by two sigma. Okay. So you know sigma, you know the uh, you know the portfolio volatility and you know the correlations between the assets. You have the variance covariance matrix. So this formula, this, this formula gives you that. You don't have to calculate a formula with a, with a computer. You just implement this formula. This is the derivative that you have. And of course, this is when the weights are these ones, the ones that we started with. So that will give you all three derivatives. Once you have all three derivatives, what I ask you to do is check whether this is true. I'm going to put this in a different color now. Once you have that, then you need to check whether these identities are true. You, you will see that very likely they will not be true, okay? which is what we expect. Otherwise, uh, we will have the same correlations as, the, uh, as zero, and that's just not the case. Hmm? Don't, don't forget, the starting point came when the correlation was zero. The correlations are really not zero, so it will be very strange if these identities would hold. They will typically not hold. Okay? So this is all I, I ask you to do this week. This is how we get started. I just want, this is, once you finish this assignment, you will see that it's actually easy. Okay? But something tells me that maybe it is ambitious in the sense that there is many different steps all easy but many different steps that we will have to take until you get to the answer we will show we'll take these steps um one by one if everything goes well we will be able to finish this by next week so in the next assignment i will be able to give you the last three steps that you need to be able to calculate the risk parity portfolio. Okay. So I want to ask questions. Is this assignment number nine clear? The notation is a little bit complicated because I'm dealing with three assets, three allocations, which will be part of a sequence. But this is something which you will be doing all in Excel and it will not take you very long. It actually will be very short Excel spreadsheet if you do it in Excel. It's something which is not very large. But it does require a different type of thinking from the way you solve most other uh, quantitative problems. So let me ask, is there any, are there any questions? About, is this clear?
you can say yes, you can say no, you can, yes, it's clear, Ying, Yu Ying says yes, Song says yes. I would like everybody to write something and tell me if this is clear. I have three answers so far. I would like to get a few more. Feel free to say no and ask, okay? As I mentioned, I'm going to make uh, this course more practical now. <clears throat> we have seen a lot of theories and now I want you to start using those theories in different ways. Only three answers. Does it mean that only three people understand and the rest do not understand? What result do I need to get at last? Okay, so for this assignment, I just need you to check whether these identities hold. Yes, it will be no, but I want you to calculate all these three numbers. Okay, so calculate all three derivatives in this assignment. Okay. B understands more. So thank you for the question. This is what I want you to do. Ask questions. The, the, the answers are easy. But I, I want to make sure that everybody understands what you need to do. More questions? Only four people are saying something, so. No? Everything is fine? Okay, so if um, so I didn't get a very good response rate, um, I wonder if uh, Ivy wants to ask something, maybe? Or maybe we can do it at the end. Okay, so I'm going to then uh, continue. I'm going to continue. I'm going to stop this um, share here and I'm going to share this one. Okay, so I remind you where we were from last week then. Uh, we, I explained how you can do investments with leverage. That means investments where you invest more money than what you have. And this money could come from a bank that lends you money, or it could come by creating, in this case, a structured credit uh, portfolio where you have bonds that you issue to collect money and the money that you get from the bonds gets invested in your particular fund or fund of funds. Okay, so we saw how uh, that works and we ended with the most sophisticated of those examples, which is the creation of a collateralized fund obligation or CFO. And we saw how uh, the bonds could be structured. We saw the relationship between the uh, yield and the, 
a rate between the yield and the uh, the probability of default of the bonds, and so on and so forth. We saw this last week. I also had the opportunity to tell you how um, <clears throat> uh, how uh, this actually worked. The first time it was done in the year two thousand and two, with a particular example of the. Um, CFO issued by Man Glenwood. <clears throat> and I mentioned something which is very advanced, which is how an increase in correlations leads to an increase of the probability of default of the bonds. And I mentioned how this is related to the 2008 financial crisis that you may know about. Uh, this was a situation where increased correlations created a lot of financial products to collapse. And the collapse happened for exactly this reason. Okay. <clears throat> as the product, as the correlations increase, the probability of default of these bonds goes up. Okay, so this is what we saw last week. What I want to do today is I want to see an application of this, which is for the creation of what's called a guaranteed product. <clears throat> guaranteed product. Guaranteed products are very commonplace in the investment sector and what they do is they give investors a guarantee that they will not lose money <clears throat> uh, these actually are very um, they have been very popular in north america about a decade ago uh, especially in the retail sector in north america and i know that in china they are very popular also they are investments for uh, risk averse people. Risk averse or risk aversion refers to the desire to minimize the risk as much as possible. Hmm? Some investors are very risk averse, which means they like investments that don't take any risk. If something bad happens, someone else will pay for that. This is an example of that. <clears throat> the structure of how it works is um, actually quite complex, but I'll, I'll show you how it works in practice, which is quite simple. It all starts with an, with an investor. In this case, it still is going to be an equity investor in the sense that it's going to have access to the upside, but the structure, the investment structure we're going to build is one where it's going to give downside protection, downside protection to the investor. In other words, if something bad happens, they're not going to lose money. And they're going to do this by giving up some of the upside. Okay? And this is the concept of the guarantee. How is this done? So this is done as follows. Uh, let me walk you through uh, this investment. First of all, um, the note that we're doing, the guaranteed note, has to be a term. No, this is something new. So, uh, up until now, all the investments we considered, they were investments where you invest and then it goes up and it goes down, and then at some point you redeem. In this case, this guaranteed note has to have a term. You have to keep the money there for a period of time. And for this example, I'm typically going to assume that you're going to keep the money for five years. You need, as you will see, you need a certain amount of time for this note to live before you can give it a guarantee at least in the way we're going to be doing this. Hmm? So we need a term, and the term very often is five years or 10 years or a number like that. Um, I know that, um, in fact, I've been involved in the creation of some uh, guaranteed products in China where the term was one year. You can do it, but as, as you will see, it's very difficult to do a guaranteed note of one year. Uh, the risk tolerance is so low that the uh, type of investment you're going to do is not going to be very interesting. Okay. You can do them, but they won't be very interesting. Let me explain how this goes. Once we understand this graph, everything will become very clear, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is, it's going to be easier for me to talk about the investor and the structure. So let's say that I have an investor that puts 100% of the money. Let's say, to continue with our uh, discussion here, 
and invested that puts $1 billion. Okay. One million. Okay. This is going to be a note that I guarantee for five years. So that means that in five years, whatever I do, I need to have one million dollars guaranteed to give back to the investor. Maybe more, but at least the one million dollars have to be guaranteed. How do I do that? I do that by purchasing a zero coupon bond. A zero coupon bond. Okay. The thing is that if I buy a zero coupon bond for a million dollars in five years, I can buy it at a discount. And the discount is going to be a function of interest rates. For example, if interest rates are approximately 10% um, per year, in five years, that is going to accumulate to um, something like maybe 40%, 50%, something like that. So I can buy it at a discount. Okay. The discount is going to be a function of interest rates. We don't know. When interest rates are very high, the discount will be very high. When interest rates are very low, like they are now, the discount is very low. Hmm? So if I'm going to buy a million dollars five years from now, I can buy them at a discount. And in this case, I'm assuming that I can buy them at an 80% discount. That means approximately 4% uh, interest per year, roughly. Okay? So with a 4% interest per year, I can buy my guarantee for 80% of the $1 million. I only need 800,000. So I use 800,000 to guarantee the 1 million. And that means that today on day one, when the note is issued, I have 20% of the money, which is 200,000. And I can do whatever I want with this. I can do anything. I could lose all this money. As long as I don't lose more than 200,000, I can lose all this money and I can still honor the guarantee. Okay? So what is what we can do with this money? This money could have a very high level of risk. Still, my note is going to have a very low risk profile. So what can I do with this money? So what I'm going to do with this money is I'm going to, this is the 20%, okay? Typically, this money, this structure has some costs. Uh, so that's why I'm putting here 2% as costs. So let's say that 2% I need to use to pay service providers. And what I really have is 18, because the, the, the guarantee of the note has to include all the costs. Okay, so all the costs of the note, they have to come from this 200,000 that we have free to invest. So let's say that 2% are the costs and I have 180,000. I have 18% of the note, it doesn't matter. So what I do is I take this 18% and I invest it in a fund or anything I want with five times leverage, five times leverage. Remember the previous section, we saw how to invest with leverage? That's what I do. And this is interesting because when I invest with leverage, what turns out that I'm doing is I'm actually borrowing money. And, and this is something which I need you to understand because this is, this is um, the first time you see this, it looks counterintuitive because I have this 80% here reserved for my guarantee and now I'm going to borrow the same 80% from somewhere else, from the bank. And the first time you see this, you think, why don't I just use the 80% that I have instead of borrowing money from the bank? And the reason is that if I take the 80%, the guarantee is lost. But if I borrow 80% from the bank, the risk is transferred. The risk of losing money is transferred from the investor to the bank. That gives me the loan. Okay, and this is where, well, one of the areas where that 2% comes up. And so this is very important that we need to understand. But now we know how to do leverage investments. So we can create a fund pool, which has five times leverage. Okay, and then 
uh, with that, I am investing almost the same amount of money as I would have without the guarantee, but now I have a guarantee. And the result is that the investor has access to almost 100% of the upside with downside protection. Okay? This is the magic of how guaranteed notes work. Um, I know, for example, in products that I know you can do uh, is you can buy <clears throat> you can uh, you can buy gold uh, with with um, uh, protection. So you buy a five year note, and if gold goes up, then you collect say sixty or seventy percent of the upside of gold going up of that. But if gold goes down in price, you get your money back. Okay, and you can do this with gold. You can do this with the Hang Seng Index. Those are very popular products too. If the Hang Seng Index goes up, you collect a portion of the upside, but if it goes down, you get your money back. You may have seen these products. A lot of these products are sold on the retail market. That means that they are advertised to the public. So you may have seen products like these. Okay, I've, I've been working with them um, with banks in China and they do they, they do that. I was working with them on this. Okay, you may have seen them. In in Europe, uh, this type of products have become they were also very popular in the year 2000, 2010, where you could uh, buy stock indices with protection. If part of the if, if the index goes up, you collect a portion of the upside, and if it goes down, you get your money back. And in North America, they, they've also been around. Uh, North American investors are typically more risky and they like higher risk profiles. They typically don't like the guarantee, but you also have these products in North America. These products are all over the world. Uh, you see them more often where investors are more risk averse. And they've, they are very often offered on stock indices. Hmm. Sounds good. You, you invest in a stock index and if the stock market goes up, you collect not all of it, but a portion of the upside. But if it goes down, you get your money back. But you have to keep your money for five years. Okay. Uh, okay. You may have seen this process or keep, if you keep the money for a year. A year is very short because interest rates, as you can see, interest rates are very uh, weak. If the discount factor, which is what allows you to build your investment, will be very small if the time is very small, right? If, if for example, interest rates are 4% and your guaranteed product is for a year, then you only have 4% to invest. If 2% goes in, in fees, then you can only invest 2%. That's a very small amount of money to invest, right? But if you do this over a long period of time, then the uh, discount is bigger so you can invest more money, like, like we see here. Okay. Now, um, there is one very important consideration. I have here one consideration, which is when you have a guaranteed note, in, in this course, I'm not doing credit risk and I'm not doing a very deep analysis of what a guarantee means. But I'll tell you one thing. When you have a product like this, you need to look very carefully at who is issuing the guarantee. Who? Not what the guarantee, not what the guarantee is, but who is making that promise. Um, there is a case, very interesting case, in Canada, actually. It's uh, the Portus Fund. This is a case in Canada. Where there was such a product, it was a product with a guarantee, but the guarantee was given by, by a company that was not a bank, was not a rated company, and was not even a reputable company. Okay. Uh, this uh, company ended up, there was some, a complicated case with fraud and other things, but this company didn't honor the obligation. So when you have a, that situation, it's very important to go back and understand who when you, see, when you have this zero coupon bond, which in this case, Portus did have a zero coupon bond, but who is issuing the guarantee?
if I issue the guarantee, that means nothing. Because I can I can promise something and then I just don't deliver. Okay, but if um, if the guarantee is issued by a rated company, like for example a bank, then it means something. And this is imp important. Many many investors in Canada were uh, defrauded by this particular situation where the guarantee was given by a company that no one had heard of that really ended up not uh, honoring the guarantee. Okay, so it's very important to. To, to do that analysis right. Okay, and what I have, have here, next slide is an example. I'm, going, I'm not gonna go through this. This is an actual case that I was involved in in the creation of a particular uh, investment um, product in, in Peru, which I did with uh, some local partners. It was a very interesting product, but I'm not going to talk about that. I'm also not gonna talk about uh, these, uh, I call them bond line products. I'm not going to, they're a bit sophisticated. I'll, I'll skip them, okay? Um, and what I want to do is I want to now move to the next topic, which is the topic of risk management, how we do risk management in an investment situation and what risk management means, okay? So, and this will be the last part of the theoretical discussion in this course. I have about an hour, maybe it's enough. If it's not enough, I'll finish next week, okay? And what I will do starting next week is I'll start to do some more practical cases. Okay, so risk management. Risk management is something which uh, you do for two reasons. You do because you don't like to lose money in your investment, but you also do it because regulators will ask you to do it. So here is very important to come up or to know that is the role of the regulator, the financial regulator. They are typically government agencies that impose a certain activity, a certain behavior in the uh, financial sector. Okay. This is, uh, so banks are regulated, insurance companies are regulated, funds are regulated in a certain way. Some of the things that we're gonna see here in risk management, funds are not regulated to do yet. They may be regulated to do later, but I'm also gonna be touching on points which are part of the banking regulation or the insurance regulation. Okay. So I'll start with uh, some considerations, some simple considerations. The first is risk exposures, okay? What does this mean? When someone talks about a risk exposure, what do you mean by that? So this could have different meanings. And I have examples here of a risk exposure report. They could mean different things. It could mean, for example, here, this is something um, that is uh, easy to understand. I have a certain portfolio where 30% is large caps where 4% is uh, mid caps and the rest is something that we don't know. It's maybe not equities, maybe it's bonds, maybe it's something else. This is a very good way of looking at the risk exposure from a, from, a, um, from a macro perspective. You just want to know what is in your portfolio. When you have a situation like this, then you know that about 50% of your portfolio are equities. They're focused on the large companies. And this is a question mark, you don't know what this is. Okay. This is the risk exposure by asset type. For example, uh, if you look back at our convertible arbitrage example, what would that be? So there we would have a 50%, uh, actually we will have about a 100% of our gross exposure to be in bonds and about 100% in equities, and then we had some treasuries. So when you add it all together, you end up having approximately two thirds fixed income, and then a third equity. That is how we did it when we were doing the convertible arbitrage trade, okay? So this is how you look at exposures from an asset mix. perspective, okay? 
Um, now you can do it in, as you can see now, if you move here to the left, you can do this in more granularity. You can actually uh, get into more details and you can see that 33.5 is equity of all possible types. And then the rest start with some ETFs here, some futures positions, some uh, uh, foreign exchange forwards, some total return swaps, some warrants or options. Um, we have some convertible bonds. This is a more granular description of my exposures. It's more granular, which means more detailed. So when you have an investment, you want to have this dual vision of what it is from, um, from a, these a different perspectives. And this gives you an idea of where you don't know what the risk is coming from. That's a different issue. But you know what your asset breakdown is, which is very important. So when um, investors talk about their risk exposures, they typically mean the allocation by asset class as you see here, okay? Uh, for many mutual funds, the answer would be 100% equities. That means there is no diversification. You have a single asset class and everything is equities. Maybe they're all large caps. Like for example, if you invest in the Hansen Index and the S&P Index, they're all large caps. Then your investment is 100% equities and 100% large caps. Not like here, which is 30%, okay? These numbers are typically expressed as tables or charts, like you see here. And you can then go with even more amount of detail and you can actually get into sectors. So you analyze the equities. The equities are typically done by sectors and you can see that the equities can be broken down into a specific sector. You have consumer discretionary here, okay? Companies that actually, uh, for example, uh, you invest in Alibaba, okay? Or you have investments in telecommunications. They're here. Now we get into the actual sectors where companies are. Or you can be invested in, for example, have cash and equivalents. How much money you actually keep in cash? You don't invest, okay? or information technology. Hmm? So this is a way to give a description of what your asset class is by sector. Okay. Imagine I ask you this, I want you to think. Imagine I ask you this. Uh, you're coming up with a portfolio, a risk parity portfolio with the S&P 500, the Hang Seng Index, and some hedge fund index. And imagine I ask you to do a breakdown or a risk exposure calculation for that portfolio. What would you do? How would you approach that? Your portfolio has three pieces. The hedge fund, you know nothing about. So that would be NA, you don't know. That's the hedge fund piece. Then you have the Hang Seng and the S&P. And you know how much money you will have in the S&P and how much money you will have in the Hang Seng Index. So you can give this picture very well. You can give that picture very well. These two you could do. How about this one? If I ask you to do a picture like that, what would you do? We're going to be more practical now. So questions like this, I'm going to be asking you more and more. How would you do this? Well, you'll have to go through the actual composition of the Hang Seng Index and the S&P Index. For the S&P, you can find this. This is published. And for the Hang Seng also, you can find this. Okay, but that's, that's more work. You're going to have to look at all of the companies in the index and which sector are they and then come up with this allocation. You can look it up because the Hang Seng Index and the S&P 500 Index are so well known and so many people have to do this analysis that these things are already done. You can find them yourselves. 
Okay, so you collect data which already exists, and then you can create this type of graphs. <coughs> okay. The hedge fund piece you know nothing about, and that will be NA you don't know, or unknown industry store right here. You see what I'm saying? This requires you to do some investigative work to get an idea of the indices that you're investing in. So this is something that you will be doing at some point there, okay? Okay, so this is um, one activity that you do in risk management, and there's a lot of risk reports which are produced using this type of thinking. Any questions? Next, is you can do the same type of analysis, but now you do it over time. Now that's much more complicated because it's not a matter of giving one chart or sorry, one, one graph or a table. You have to do this over time. Some people do this every day. You have here a graph done every day, or you can do this quarterly. Quarterly is very common. Okay, every quarter you do the analysis and you see how it evolves over time. And when you do that, there is a very interesting concept because how do you deal with the short exposure? You see, when you are doing trades, sometimes you are only long, but sometimes you are short too. So you ha typically what you do is you divide the long exposure and the short exposure and you track them differently. And when you do that, suddenly a new term appears, which is the gross exposure. Okay. Gross exposure is typically the, um, you have a net exposure and then you have a gross exposure. The gross exposure is the addition of the longs and the shorts and the short ex and the net exposure is the longs minus the shorts. That will be gross exposure and that will be net. Okay. By the way, in this, uh, in this graph, the, um, the colors are wrong. Uh, the uh, net exposure is the gross exposure and the gross exposure. So the, the colors are wrong, okay? So I'll, I'll note colors are wrong in this graph, okay? But it doesn't matter. This is just for ex explanation purposes. So that is gross exposure. Longs and shorts are gross and long minus short is net. So for example, let's say that we go to our convertible arbitrage example. Okay, where you invest $80 in a bond, then you short $70 of the stock, you short $70 of the stock, so you short the stock, okay, and then you're $70 long at T bill. Hmm? What is your um, What is your expo what will be the exposure here? <clears throat> the gross exposure is 80 plus 70 plus 70. It's 220. So with $80, you have $220 worth of gross exposure, very large. What's your net exposure? The net exposure is 80 because the 70 with the stock and the 70 with the T-bill, they cancel out. So the net exposure is 80, but the gross exposure is 220. Is it 220? Yeah. Which means your leverage is about three times. Leverage, we saw uh, last week, is how much money we borrow. But leverage could also be seen as the ratio between gross exposure divided by net exposure. That's another way of expressing what leverage is. In this case, that is about three times. From a certain perspective, the risk in your portfolio comes from the net exposure. And we saw that in the convertible arbitrage trade, right? And typically we had three investments, two of them go hand in hand. Okay. And in fact, they all move together 
So you're not particularly worried. We also saw this when we had an equity long portfolio. If you're long some stocks and short some stocks, they typically move together. So your exposure is closer to net than to gross. But if something bad happens, something really bad happens, this can move against you and this can move against you too. And then the risk is going to come from the gross, not from the net. So in normal times, in normal times, your risk comes from the net exposure. In terms of crisis, your risk typically comes from the gross exposure. And gross is always bigger than net. Sometimes it's a lot bigger than net. We just saw it. Sometimes in our case, it was three times, right? So that's why it's very important to keep track of the exposures, gross and net, and maybe even over time. And the reason is when something bad happens, crisis, your risk is a lot bigger than you think. Okay. All right. Okay. So we're, yeah, we'll see. I don't think we'll see examples about this, but this is uh, something that I want you to be aware of. Okay. Um, <clears throat> next, related to um, exposures, this is not exactly risk management, but it's a good practice. Is what's called P and L attribution. I, I, these terms are new. I don't know if you know them or you. I don't know. This is. PNL is a term which stands for profit and loss. This is the, the function that tracks how much money you make or you lose. It's called PNL. And it measures just as well the gains and the losses. It could be positive, it could be negative. If it's positive, that means that you made money. It's a good thing. If it's negative, it means that you lost money. Not a good thing. But when you make money and you lose money, you want to do P and L attribution, what does that mean? That means that you want to know what is making you money and what's losing your money. Okay, so you want to go beyond the total amount of money you made or lost by trying to allocate it to the different sectors, strategies, asset classes, whatever it is. And I have examples here of how this is done. <clears throat> so, for example, in this case, we can see that consumer discretionary uh, is right here is making us a lot of money and information technology is making us a lot of money. And there's many ways to do that. You can do this by looking at dollars or percent. Sorry. You can do it by looking at dollars or percentages. Or percentages. Dollars or percentages. What does that mean? Dollars means how much money you're actually making. And percentage is how much money you're making relative to how much you invest. So, for example, if you have a very large investment on a certain sector, of course, that will probably give you a lot of gains or a lot of losses because it's big, right? And that's where you look at dollars. But if you want to understand how profitable that is, if you invest a lot of money, of course, you will make a lot of money. But if you make a lot of money investing a little bit of money, that you express in percentages. So that's why when you do a graph like this, you want to do both. You always want to do both. You want to do this PNL attribution on a dollar basis or on a relative basis. You, need, you typically want to do both. Okay. And you can do this by sectors, as we have here. See, sector. Or you can do this, for example, by market cap. Market cap is. Uh, which of these companies are large, which ones are small. So, for example, here you can see that most of your money is coming from the large cap. But here I'm not telling you that these are dollars, okay? It's not, you can see it right there. But if I don't tell you that this is the attribution to that particular large cap, how do you know if this is a very big amount because I invested a lot of money or this is a very big amount because this was a very profitable sector. You don't know. That's why you have to look at both. Okay. So my recommendation here is when you do this attribution, you have to look at both. 
they give you different information. When you do risk management, um, typically, when you do risk management, typically, uh, dollars is the one that matters. Dollars is the one that matters. Why? Because if a certain small investment is making you a lot of money, typically the risk coming from that would be very low. Uh, risk management is about preventing bad things from happening. Okay? And bad things is typically um, expressed in size, not in percentages. So when you do risk management, uh, typically you care about dollars, but when you do investment, you care about percentages. These are the two perspectives. Risk is typically focused on absolute quantities, absolute, and performance or relative is typically the perspective of investing. Relative, absolute and relative. Okay. And that's what PNL attribution. Okay. Sorry, this, uh, I can't remove this. I have to stop the share and reshare. Sometimes the display gets uh, stuck. Okay. Good. All right. And this is the same thing as we saw before, but this is with numbers. The reason is when you're doing PL attribution, very often there's a lot of things to analyze, and charts or dis graphic displays are oftentimes not enough. So you need to go through the entire list of um, analysis. So for example, in large cap or mid cap, then you can see the, the um, amount of money lost. This is in absolute, this is in dollars, okay? And you can do this for the month, for the year, or since you started, for all of history. You can also do the day. Okay, so these are typical tables that you do when you are doing this. Uh, if when you do it by sector, yeah, same thing, you have the sectors here, and then you have the absolute amounts, uh, which are done by day, by month, or by year. Okay. Okay. And you can do the same thing by asset class, you know, corporate, convertibles. And same thing. And in this chart that you see here, these are all dollars. Everywhere there are dollars. Okay. If you do this with a relative with per with percentages, they would be different. If you do this with percentages, they will be different. And percentages by the amount invested on that particular sector. Hmm? Another way of doing PL attribution. We share again, something happened again. Okay. All right. The next topic that I want to discuss is the concept of cash and counterparty risk. <laughs> and this is, I want you to think about the following to understand this. When you invest money, uh, you typically have your money and your securities in a bank. Remember that example where we went and bought, um, we, we went nine long A and we had nine short B. Remember that? We showed that a few weeks ago. Okay, that's good. And that was, we had $1,000. I remember that example, we had $1,000. Okay, but here's the question. Where is A and where is B? It, it may sound like a strange question, but when you buy A's or when you short B's, you typically don't have them yourself. They are typically in the bank. So you are, you are, you are often in the situation where the $1,000 is somewhere 
the A's are somewhere and the B's could be somewhere else. And they could all be in different places. Hmm? If that's the case, when you have your portfolio, it could be spread over many different counterparties. Then you want to know how much money is in each of the counterparties because sometimes banks default. Sometimes banks um, um, blow up. We had the example of 2008 and there were several banks. Lehman Brothers was the best example of that. People who had deals with Lehman Brothers, with the broker, they ended up uh, losing money in weird ways sometimes. Okay. So to prevent that from happening, you have to do an analysis which is very unusual, which is you need to keep track of how much money you have in each of the banks that you deal with, which hold your cash. And the idea is that, uh, so this is not about the market going up or down. This is not about an investment in your technology stocks, uh, losing money or making money. This is the bank that has your technology stocks blowing up and disappearing. So you have to do that risk analysis too. Now for this course, this is something which is very unusual. We're not going to spend any time on this, but some of you will be banking professionals. And I want you to know that when you are a banking professional or an investment professional, when you are an investment professional, you will have to keep track of where your money is. And you will have to consider the possibility that the bank that holds your assets blows up and ceases to exist. Because of that, you maintain this analysis of where your money is, which is how much was the total value of your assets, and you may have some longs and shorts, you may have some gross exposure, you may have some net exposure. And you already saw that we mentioned the concept of a margin. We did that when we were doing the 9A, 9B portfolio, remember? So you need to keep track of the margin. Why? Because when you have assets with a certain broker, you have assets and you have securities and you have obligations and they have obligations to you. So you want to make sure that the risk that you have to them is not um, very big, but also they have risk to you and that's expressed in the margin requirements. So the margin requirement that we saw from a risk management perspective now acquires a different meaning because the margin requirement is, is, is the risk of others to you. Okay, and this is something I want to highlight. In everything we have done before here, when we look at that, this is the, in particular, say here, this is the risk of yours from others. This is the risk of yours from others. But when you go to margin, margin is the risk of you to others. It's the opposite risk. It's the risk that they see coming from you. And you have to monitor that. We already saw that, how you do it. We saw that a few weeks ago. And this is something that when you're doing risk management, you also have to maintain. And you have to know that the amount of money of cash you have with your counterparty is enough to cover the margin. If it's not enough to cover the margin or if the number is very close to the margin, then you may run into a margin call and we saw a margin call is not a good thing. So this also affects the health of now you as your risk, not just the others, uh, risk coming from you. So you need to make sure that the balance of cash that you have and the margin requirements that you have are um, adequate. I need to make a, I, I need to make now a, a, this is a very important point and I'm going to link this with something else. Um, I have to stop this share and share something, remind you of something we already saw which is here. Okay, so I have to show you something different now. It, it should, you already saw it, but this is the time when I can show you something which is something that we already saw that now I want to do in a different way. So allow me to bring this new document, which is not opening.
Sorry, I have. So I'm having some problem. I'll show you this. Okay, so here we are. I'm not sure if you remember this, but I want to show you anyway. Okay. Remember this? Uh, at some point I described the, we calculated the probability of a margin call. We were exp explaining margin calls here. And then I gave you the probability of a margin call. And this was useful because it tells us uh, it gave us a context in which we wanted to understand how much money to invest, how much risk to take. That was the context in which this, this thing showed up. And then we showed that if we take a very uh, risky position, then the probability of a margin goal will go up. Okay, so this is the type of risk management that you do. This type of risk management is preemptive. Brilliant bread. This type of risk management is preemptive. You do this because you want to avoid risks. That's how you do that. Okay, so this information is useful. It tells you that if the probability of a margin goal is very high, you don't want to do that. And this is typically what you do before to invest. This is the analogy you do before to invest. You don't know the future, so you have to rely on mathematics and quantitative techniques to understand what that future may bring you. Okay? That's how analysis is done. But once the investment is done, once the investment is done, the story changes. Once this, the, the investment is done, the story changes. Now, you there may be a certain probability of a margin call, but you not, now you have to monitor the actual numbers that may trigger a margin call. So if this gets close, this may trigger a margin call. You see? So this, this table here is very interesting because it brings two worlds together. It brings the world of the analysis, which is what this course is about. You want to analyze things so they can be good investors. But it brings it with another aspect, which is once you are investing, once the money has already been deployed, then you have to conduct a certain activity of monitoring what that risk is. And that's what we're seeing here. If you have done your analysis well, and you've done your decisions well, then you should never be in trouble. But you don't know that, you have to monitor that, and that's how you monitor this, okay? So I don't know if this is clear, but this is how you have to do things. You have to do good analysis, which allows you to prevent problems, but then you have to monitor um, what you're doing to ensure that as the investment is real, then these um, risks do not happen. Okay. Okay. And I think this is it. All right. Good. So that's from this perspective. I'm going to now. Well, leverage, we have seen what it is. And this is the leverage uh, through time. This is a different uh, concept of leverage that I'm posting, but it doesn't matter. You want to, leverage could mean the um, um, debt to equity ratio, okay? Uh, how much money you owe divided by how much money you actually own. Or it could be the gross exposure, as we saw earlier, divided by the net exposure. 
okay if a little bit of money is giving you access to a lot of money then you will see that that leverage goes up and if not it goes down so there's one possible definition here another possible definition here or others there are many many possible definitions okay um, and when you are investing you want to monitor as many of them as possible typically high leverage is not a good thing from a risk perspective it's great from a is great from a return perspective performance is good always better on average when a leverage is high gains are going to be much much better but so will be losses so high leverage high leverage from a risk perspective is bad and low leverage from a risk perspective is good that's from a risk perspective but from an investment perspective high leverage is profitable and low leverage is less profitable okay and when you think of what we saw about the Markovich theory of two months ago now Okay. There was a risk and return. Risk was not good, return was good. And you can see that here again. So we are constantly bringing back to the same perspective of risk and return. What is good for return is bad for risk. And what is um, bad for return is sometimes good for risk. Not always, okay? But you have to maintain both in sync. And that's why as we consider risk management, you're going to see that risk management and return are oftentimes opposite to each other. Okay. All right. Good. So I'm going to now uh, continue with this liquidity. Okay. So this term is new. Uh, this is something which is, and it's actually quite elusive. Uh, understanding good liquidity is something very elusive. Um, so let me make a few considerations. What does liquidity mean? Liquidity risk. Uh, this is liquidity risk. Okay. Risk. If you have a portfolio and something bad happens, you want to sell it. You want to get rid of it. Sometimes you can do that very fast. Sometimes not. If you can do it very fast, then the liquidity risk is low. Or your portfolio has high liquidity. Hmm? That's always a good thing. If something bad happens and you can get rid of your positions within a few minutes, then you're going to be able to avoid risks very, very nicely. Okay. You'll have to be very fast, but sometimes you have assets which are very illiquid. You'll take a long time before you can sell them. Imagine that all of your money is in a building that you bought and now you need money. What do you do? You have to sell the building. How long does it take to sell a building? It takes a long time. How long does it take to sell a stock? Who can tell me? Maybe I can get you to say something. How long does it take you to sell a stock? No answers. Maybe in the chat, if you don't want to speak, how long does it take you to sell a stock? Has anybody bought a stock? Has anybody bought a stock? How long does it take you to buy, to buy it? How long does it take you to sell it? So a stock, you can sell very quickly, usually, not always. But how long does it take you to sell a lot of stocks? If a certain stock trades, I'm going to make give you an example. Let's say that you have a particular stock that sells 1 million stocks per day. If it says 1 million, if it trades 1 million stocks per day and you want to buy or sell one stock, you'll do it very fast. 
because it's a million which are traded per day. That means there is about 100,000 traded per hour. That means there is thousands traded per minute. You'll do it very fast. Yours will be one of many, many of them. But let's say that you want to sell 10 million stocks. How long will it take you to sell 10 million stocks? How long? You understand my question? Please answer. If a stock trades around 1 million every day and you want to sell 10 million stocks, how long will it take you? Ten days. Okay, so ten days looks like the right answer because it's ten divided by one, which is ten. In practice, so thank you for giving an answer. In practice, it will take you a lot more, a lot more. Why? Because if you go to the market and you say market trades one million, and now you add another million, you are increasing the volume by twice as much. Right? And the market, guess what? The market is going to notice that now the volume is going up. And when the volume is going up, no one wants to sell and no one wants to buy. So volume actually goes down. So this is interesting. The effect of you buying or selling stock is nothing. The market will not care. You're normal. But if now you become as big as the market and you want to buy or sell the same amount as the market, then suddenly the market will stop being liquid and people will stop trading just because you're doing a very big trade. Right? Um, so the, you, you understand? So very likely it'll take you a month to do this or longer. because your trade is so big that it actually affects the market volume. Okay. So liquidity is very difficult to understand. It's very difficult to understand, but there's some parameters that people work with. For example, there's one assumption, which is that you can typically trade one third of the daily volume and the market will accept it. In other words, if, if you have a certain market which trades 1 million per day, according to this, you can trade about 300,000 stocks per day yourself. Which means that if you're going to do a 10 million stock trade, it will take you 10 million divided by 0 0.3, which is about 30, which is more than a month. You see? So this is not simple arithmetic. This is understanding how financial markets work. And financial markets have this way of behaving. You have to know. In practice, no one really knows. But this is a good rule of thumb. You have to make a guess. Okay. Um, okay. And this week, to give you a break from the, uh, from a, to give you a break from the um, portfolio construction uh, assignment, which will continue. I'm going to ask you a different type of assignment. I'm going to ask you for the most illiquid stock you can find in the Hang Seng, uh, in the uh, Hong Kong market. Okay. Let's see what you can do. How are you going to be doing that? You have to check the liquidity of the stocks. How are you going to do that?
you're going to look for trade volumes. How can you look for trade volumes? Is this information public? We saw it actually. When we looked at the Hansen index, we saw that information is public. So I will ask you for the stocks in the Hansen index to see which one is the least, the least liquid. Okay. And if we go to the Shanghai index, you will see that the liquidity is even lower. Now you have a way of measuring liquidity, which is by looking at the daily volume of trading. Hmm. Okay, which is a number that many people don't pay attention to, but you have to pay attention if you're going, if you're going to be trading that stock in big numbers, in small numbers, no one cares, but in big numbers, then uh, you have to track that, that liquidity of that stock. Okay, so that's for stocks. And uh, that is something that you can do. How about the liquidity for bonds? How can we check the liquidity for bonds? Bonds have another problem. Right? You also want to buy and sell bonds and, and you want to buy and sell bonds quickly. If you cannot do it quickly, then your liquidity risk increases. But of course, the problem with bonds, bonds do not trade on, a, on, a, on an exchange. If you want to buy or sell a bond, you have to go to a broker who will have to buy a seller or a buyer for you. And typically, this thing is, it takes time. It takes a lot more time than going to an exchange. So because of that, the, um, the way to measure the bond liquidity is different. We're not going to pay attention to that in this course, but I just want to tell you that when you're analyzing bonds, the liquidity of a bond comes from two main sources. One is the number of dealers. Dealers are the, are the, the brokers that buy or sell that bond. Okay, um, bonds which have a lot of liquidity have a lot of dealers. And also the size of the transactions. The size of the transactions can be a double-edged sword, meaning that you don't know which way it's going to affect you. If the transactions are all very large, then it will be difficult for you to do a small transaction. If the transactions are all very small and you are going to do a large transaction, it will also be difficult for you to do the transaction. Okay, so doing liquidity analysis for bonds is, is difficult. It includes many different variables. It's, in the case of stocks, it's very simple. It's the volume. It's a one-dimensional. It's a one-dimensional consideration. But in case of bonds, it's multi-dimensional. The more uh, dealers, the better. The bigger volume, the better could be or, or not, depending on the size of your portfolio and what you want to do, okay? So we're gonna stay with stocks when we do analyze liquidity and the daily trading volume is what matters. Now the daily trading volume, it has to be relative to what? Is it the number of stocks? Is the number of stocks relative to the total number of stocks? Some companies have a lot of stocks outstanding and some have a few number of stocks outstanding. So when you analyze the liquidity of your portfolio, you need to look at the volume divided by the number of stocks that the company has issued. Okay. And that, that's, that's going to be the assignment I want you to do this week. I'll give you, I, I'll give you some time to recover from the um, uh, portfolio construction assignment, and that's what you will do. You have to go to the database, to the Hang Seng Index, uh, uh, and, and figure out the, uh, the stocks that you have there. You have to look at the daily volumes, and you have to look at the number of stocks that each company has. Divide and take the uh, smallest number that will be the most liquid stock. Okay, you will see some are very liquid and some are less liquid. 
And there are, I mean, we're going to uh, Hong Kong where liquidity is high. If you go to other uh, indices, sorry, you go to other uh, stocks or other uh, exchanges, you will see that the liquidity is considerably lower. Understand? And, and liquidity is a very big source of risk, which is very hard to quantify. It's very hard to quantify. And it typically only uh, hurts you when you are in, the, in need. You typically don't sell because you're making a lot of money. Sometimes you sell because you need the money. And if that's the case, then liquidity can hurt you very badly. There's a way to monitor that and you say, in, in visualizing liquidity, visualizing data is something very important and visualizing liquidity in particular. What I have here is an example of a way to visualize liquidity. So uh, what I have here is in this axis is what I have is the gross exposure is the dollar amount invested. And what I have here is the time, the time it takes to sell. So for example, this would be bad. It's a bad, it's, it's a large position that takes a long time to unwind. This is good. It's a small position and I can get rid of it very quickly. How about this? This good or bad? It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Um, it's it's not very small, not very big. Okay, but it's gonna take me time to sell. But it's not very big. Okay, that would be very bad. This is okay, but I'll say it's not good. How about this one here? This is okay. I can sell it quickly. It's big, but I can sell it quickly. And you see, when I say this is here, this is relative to the trading volume. So this is already normalized. Okay. If the trading volume is low, then this pushes these points to the right. That's the way we're understanding liquidity. Okay, I think I don't want to do any more concepts today. Let me just see. I don't think I want to do any more concepts today. I think I want to end with liquidity. Yeah, no, I don't want to do stress tests. I want to do liquidity. I want to make sure that this is understood. And I want you to actually go and do the assignment, which is get uh, to the um, uh, Hang Seng uh, exchange, the Hong Kong exchange and get me a liquidity. I, I just want the least liquid stock you can find. Taking this definition into account, okay? You have to look at the daily trading volume and divide that by the number of outstanding stocks of that company. This number will change, will change every day sometimes. Okay, so either you have to look at the average trading volume or if you pick a certain day, you have to tell me which day that is because your analysis will have a different answer on different days. Everybody understands what I'm saying here? I'll write the assignment for you, but is this something that you understand? If you, if you don't understand what I'm saying now, when I write it down, you will not understand either. When I write it down, I only give you precise information, but you need to understand what I'm asking you to do. So I need to understand what liquidity is, and how it manifests itself when we're looking at stocks. Is clear? Okay. And I give you a break uh, from the. You still, you still have to do the assignment of the um, of the risk parity portfolio, which will be very good for you. You're going to learn a lot doing that assignment. But uh, this is a completely different assignment. This does not require that you do anything complicated. You only have to do a division. But you have to look for data. You have to look for data and you have to analyze that data like we did here. Okay, so I have two minutes. Um, are there any questions? I assume the answer is no, but are there any questions? Is this clear? I would like for more participation from you. It's going to be easier, especially now that we're going to get to do more practical things. But... Yeah.
Yeah. Okay, then I will end the class here today. I wish you well. I hope you stay uh, safe and healthy. And I will be seeing you next week. <laughs>